Yes. Okay. So back to Poincaré. So um, he's, you know, it's funny. This book is filled with kind of, you know, mathematical characters who often are kind of peevish or get into feuds or sort of have like weird enthusiasms um, because those people are fun to write about and they sort of like say very salty things. Poincaré is actually none of this. As far as I can tell, he was an extremely normal dude <laughs> who didn't get into fights with people and everybody liked him and he was like pretty personally modest and he had very regular habits. You know what I mean? He, he did math for like four hours in the morning and four hours in the evening mm-hmm. and that was it. Like he had his <laughs> schedule. Um, I actually, it was like, I, I still am feeling like somebody's going to tell me now that the book is out like, oh, didn't you know about this like incredibly sordid episode yeah. of history? As far as I could tell, uh, a completely normal guy. But um, he just kind of, in many ways, creates uh, the geometric world in which we live. And, and you know, he, his first really big success uh, is this prize paper he writes for this prize offered by the King of Sweden um, for the study of the three-body problem. Um the study of what we can say about, yeah, three astronomical objects moving in what you might think would be this very simple way. Nothing's going on except gravity. Uh, so relating. what's the three-body problem? Why is it a problem? So, so the problem is to understand um, when this motion is stable and when it's not. So stable meaning they would sort of like end up in some kind of periodic orbit. Or, or I guess it would mean, sorry, stable would mean they never sort of fly off far apart from each other. And unstable would mean like eventually they fly apart. So understanding two bodies is much easier. When yes, you exactly. The third, uh, <laughs> two bodies, third they, wheel is this is what problem. Newton knew. Two bodies, they sort of orbit each other in some kind of, a, uh, either in an ellipse, which is the stable case. You know, that's what the planets do that we know. Um, or uh, one travels on a hyperbola around the other. That's the unstable case. It sort of like zooms in from far away, sort of like whips around the heavier thing and like zooms out. Um, those are basically the two options. So it's a very simple and easy to classify story. With three bodies, just the small switch from two to three, uh, it's a complete zoo. It's the first example. What we would say now is it's the first example of what's called chaotic dynamics, mm-hmm. where the stable solutions and the unstable solutions, they're kind of like wound in among each other. And a very, very, very tiny change in the initial conditions can make the long-term behavior of the system completely different. So Poincaré was the first to recognize that that phenomenon even uh, even existed. What about the uh, conjecture that carries his name? Right. So he also um, was one of the pioneers of taking geometry, um, which until that point had been largely the study of two and three dimensional objects, because that's like what we see, right? <laughs> that's those are the objects we interact with. Um, he developed the subject we now call topology. He called it analysis situs. He was a very well-spoken guy with a lot of slogans, but that name did not, you can see why that name did not catch on. So now mm-hmm. it's, it's called topology now. Um, Sorry, what was it called before? Analysis situs, okay. which I guess sort of roughly means like the analysis of location or something like that. Like um, huh. it's, a, it's a Latin phrase. Um, partly because he understood that even to understand stuff that's going on in our physical world, you have to study higher dimensional spaces. How does this how does this work? And this is kind of like where my brain went to it because you were talking about not just where things are, but what their path is, how they're moving. When we were talking about the path from two to three, mm-hmm. um, he understood that if you want to study three to, three bodies moving in space, well, each uh, each body it has a location where it is. So it has an x coordinate, a y coordinate, a z coordinate, right? I can specify a point in space by giving you three numbers. But it also, at each moment, has a velocity. So it turns out that really to understand what's going on, you can't think of it as a point, or you could, but it's better not to think of it as a point in three-dimensional space that's moving. It's better to think of it as a point in six-dimensional space where the coordinates are where is it and what's its velocity right now. That's a higher dimensional space called phase space. And if you haven't thought about this before, I admit that it's a little bit mind bending. But what he needed then was a geometry that was flexible enough, not just to talk about two dimensional spaces or three dimensional spaces, but any dimensional space. So the sort of famous first line of this paper where he introduces analysis situs is, is no one doubts nowadays that the geometry of n-dimensional space is an actually existing thing, right? I think that ha- maybe that had been controversial. And he's saying like, look, let's face it, just because it's not physical doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean we shouldn't study Interesting. 
he wasn't jumping to the physical the physical interpretation like it does it can be real even if it's not perceivable to the human cognition i think i think that's right i think don't get me wrong poincare never strays far from physics he's always motivated by physics but the physics drove him to need to think about spaces of higher dimension. And so he needed a formalism that was rich enough to enable him to do that. And once you do that, that formalism is also gonna include things that are not physical. And then you have two choices. You can be like, oh, well, that stuff's trash. Or, but I th- and this is more the mathematician's frame of mind, if you have a formalistic framework that like seems really good and sort of seems to be like very elegant and work well, and it includes all the physical stuff, Maybe we should think about all of it. Like, maybe we should think about it. Think, you know, maybe there's some gold to be mined there. Um, and indeed, like, you know, guess what? Like, before long, there's relativity and there's space time. And like, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, yeah, maybe it's a good idea. We already had this geometric apparatus, like, set up for, like, how to think about four-dimensional <laughs> spaces. Like, turns out they're real after all. So, so, you know, this is a, a a story much told, right, in mathematics, not just in this context, but in many. I'd love to dig in a little deeper on that, actually, because I have some... Uh intuitions to work out <laughs> okay in my, my brain well but i'm not a mathematical physicist so we can I, like, work I, them out together <laughs> good we'll uh we'll, we'll we'll together walk along the path of curiosity but poincare uh conjecture what is it the poincare conjecture is about curved three-dimensional spaces so i was on my way there i promise um the idea is that we perceive ourselves as living in we don't say a three-dimensional space. We just say three-dimensional space. You know, you can go up and down. You can go left and right. You can go forward and back. There's three dimensions in which we can move. In Poincaré's theory, there are many possible three-dimensional spaces. In the same way that going down one dimension to sort of capture our intuition a little bit more, we know there are lots of different two-dimensional surfaces, right? There's a balloon, and that looks one way, and a donut looks another way, and a Mobius strip looks a third way. Those are all like two-dimensional surfaces that we can kind of really uh, get a global view of because we live in three-dimensional space. So we can see a two-dimensional surface sort of sitting in our three-dimensional space. Well, to see a three-dimensional space whole, we'd have to kind of have four-dimensional eyes, right? Which we don't. So we have to use our mathematical eyes. We have to envision. Um, The Poincaré conjecture uh, says that there's a very simple way to determine whether a three-dimensional space... um, is the standard one, the one that we're used to. Um, And essentially, it's that it's what's called fundamental group has nothing interesting in it. And that I can actually say without saying what the fundamental group is, I can tell you what the criterion is. This would be good. Oh, look, I can even use a visual aid. So for the people watching this on YouTube, you'll just see this. For the people uh, on the podcast, you'll have to visualize it. So Lex has been nice enough to like give me a surface with some interesting topology. It's a mug. Right here in front of me. A mug, yes. I might say it's a genus one surface, but we could also say it's a mug, same thing. Um, So if I were to draw a little circle on this mug, oh, which way should I draw it so it's visible? Like here, okay. Yeah, that's good. If I draw a little circle on this mug, imagine this to be a loop of string. I could pull that loop of string closed on the surface of the mug, right? That's definitely something I could do. I could shrink it, shrink it, shrink it until it's a point. On the other hand, if I draw a loop that goes around the handle, I can kind of zhuzh it up here and I can zhuzh it down there and I can sort of slide it up and down the handle, but I can't pull it closed, can I? It's trapped. Mm -hmm. Not without breaking the surface of the mug, right? Not without like going inside. So um, the condition of being what's called simply connected, this is uh, one of Poincaré's inventions, says that any loop of string can be pulled shut. So it's a feature that the mug simply does not have. This is a non-simply connected mug and a simply connected mug would be a cup. Right, you would burn your hand when you drank coffee out of it. So you're saying the universe is not a mug. Well, I can't speak to the universe, but what I can say is that um, regular old space is not a mug. Regular old space, if you like, sort of actually physically have like a loop of string, you can always close it. You can pull it shut. You can always pull it shut. But you know, what if your piece of string was the size of the universe? Like, what if your your piece of string was like billions of light years long? Like, like, how do you actually know? I mean, that's still an open question of the right. shape of the universe. Exactly. Right? Whether it's, uh, I think there's a lot, there is ideas of it being a Taurus. I mean, there is there's some trippy ideas and they're not like weird out there, controversial. There's legitimate at the center of uh, cosmology debate. I mean, I think- I think there's somebody think who thinks flat. that there's like some kind of dodecahedral symmetry. Or I mean, I remember reading something crazy about somebody saying that they saw the signature of that in the 
cosmic noise or what have you. I mean, to make the flat earthers happy, I do believe that the current main belief is it's fl it's flat, it's flat-ish or something like that. The shape of the universe is flat-ish. I don't know what the heck that means. I think that <laughs> I think that has like a very. I mean, how are you even supposed to think about the shape of a thing that doesn't have any thing outside of it. I mean. Ah, but that's exactly what topology does. Topology is what's called an intrinsic theory. That's what's so great about it. This question about the mug, you could answer it without ever leaving the mug, right? Because it's a question about a loop drawn on the surface of the mug and what happens if it never leaves that surface. So it's like always there. See, but that's the, the difference between the topology and say, if you're like uh, trying to visualize a mug, you can't visualize a mug while living inside the mug. <laughs> well, that's true. The visualization is harder, but in some sense, no, you're right, but if the tools of mathematics are there. I, I, sorry, I don't want to fight, but I was like, the tools of mathematics are exactly there yeah. to enable you to think about what you cannot visualize in this way. Let me give, let's go, always to make things easier, go down a dimension. Um, let's think about we live on a circle, okay? You can tell whether you live on a circle or a line segment. Because if you live in a circle, if you walk a long way in one direction, you find yourself back where you started. And if you live in a line segment, you walk for a long enough in one direction, you come to the end of the world. Or if you live on a line, like a whole line, an infinite line, then you walk in one direction for a long time. And like, well, then there's not a sort of terminating algorithm to figure out whether you live on a line or a circle, but at least you sort of, um, at least you don't discover that you live on a circle. So all of those are intrinsic things, right? All of those are things that you can figure out about your world without leaving your world. On the other hand, ready? Now we're going to go from intrinsic to extrinsic. Boy, did I not know we were going to talk about this, but why not? Why not? If you can't tell whether you live in a circle or a knot, like imagine like a knot floating in three-dimensional space. The person who lives on that knot, to them, it's a circle. Yeah. They walk a long way. They come back to where they started. Now we, with our three-dimensional eyes, can be like, oh, this one's just a plain circle and this one's knotted up. But that's an, that's a that has to do with how they sit in three-dimensional space. It doesn't have to do with intrinsic features of those people's world. We can ask you one ape to another. Does it make you, how does it make you feel that you don't know if you live in a circle or on a knot, in a knot, in inside the string that forms the knot? I'm gonna be, <laughs> I don't even I'm, know how to say that. I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't know if I, 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 I fear you won't like this answer, but it does not bother me at all. It does. I don't lose one minute of sleep over it. So, like, does it bother you that if we look at like a Mobius strip, that you don't have an obvious way of knowing whether you are inside of cylinder, if you live on a surface of a cylinder or you live on the surface of a Mobius strip? Uh, no, I think you can tell if you live. If which one? Because if what you do is you like tell your friend, "Hey, stay right here. I'm just going to go for a walk," and then you like walk for a long time in one direction, and then you come back and you see your friend again. And if your friend is reversed, then you know you live on a Mobius strip. Well, no, because you won't see your friend, right? Okay, fair fair <laughs> point, fair point on that. And I, but you you have to believe his stories about, no, I don't even know. I, I, I would, would you even know? Would you really? Oh, no, would, you're, no, your point is right. Let me try to think of a better, let's see if I can do this on it, the fly. It may not be correct to talk about <laughs> cognitive beings living on a Mobius strip because there's a lot of things taken for granted there. And we're constantly imagining actual like three-dimensional creatures, like how it actually feels like to uh, to live on a Mobius strip is tricky to, to internalize. I think that on what's called the real projective plane, which is kind of even more sort of like messed up version of the Mobius strip, but with very similar features, this feature of kind of like only having one side, that has the feature that there's a loop of string which can't be pulled closed, but if you loop it around twice along the same path, that you can pull closed. That's extremely weird. Yeah. Um, but that would be a I way you could know without leaving your world that <laughs> something very funny is going on. You know what's extremely weird? Maybe we can comment on, hopefully it's not too much of a tangent, is I remember thinking about this. This might be right. This might be wrong. But if you're, if we now talk about a sphere and you're living inside a sphere that you're going to see everywhere around you, the back of your own head. That I was, 
Because like I was, this was very counterintuitive to me to think about, maybe it's wrong, but because I was thinking of like earth, you know, your 3D thing on sitting on a sphere. But if you're living inside the sphere, like you're going to see, if you look straight, you're always going to see yourself all the way around. So everywhere you look, there's going to be the back of your own head. <laughs> I think somehow this depends on something of like how the physics of light works in this scenario, which I'm sort true. of finding it hard to bend my... I mean, that's true. The C is doing a lot of work. Like saying you see something is doing a lot of work. People have thought about this. I mean, this this metaphor of like, what if we're like little creatures in some sort of smaller world? Like how could we apprehend what's outside? That that's metaphor right. just comes back and back. And actually, I didn't even realize like how frequent it is. It comes up in the book a lot. I know it from a book called Flatland. I don't know if you ever mm -hmm. read this when you were a kid a while or ago, yeah. an adult. You know, this this uh, sort, of, sort of comic novel from the 19th century about an entire two-dimensional world uh, it's narrated by a square. That's the main character. And um, the kind of strangeness that befalls him when, you know, one day he's in his house and suddenly there's like a little circle there and they're with him. And then the circle, but then the circle like starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And he's like, what the hell is going on? It's like a horror movie, like for two dimensional people. And of course, what's happening is that a sphere is entering his world. And as the sphere kind of like moves farther and farther into the plane, it's cross section, the part of it that he can see. To him, it looks like there's like this kind of bizarre being that's like getting larger and larger and larger um, until it's exactly sort of halfway through. And then they have this kind of like philosophical argument where the sphere is like, I'm a sphere, I'm from the third dimension. The square is like, what are you talking about? There's no such thing. And they have this kind of like, sterile argument where the square is not able to kind of like follow the mathematical reasoning of the sphere until the sphere just kind of grabs him and like jerks him out of the plane and pulls him up and it's like now like now do you see like now do you see your whole world that you yeah. didn't understand before <laughs>